Hi, welcome back to my channel. This week I thought we would do something a little bit different and instead of a cocktail, I thought I would talk you through um, some of my most essential things to keep in your bar cabinet or in your bar trolley or wherever you keep your spirits. So, um, I've managed to whittle it down to, what have I got, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, technically eight bottles, which I would say could make you a fair variety of cocktails. As I go through talking about them, I will also, you know, mention some alternatives or additions. So I'd say, you know, flexibly eight to 10 bottles could really furnish you with a very adequate bar for making a whole host of different things at home. There are, of course, other ingredients that you will need. Sugar syrup is probably the number one most used one, and then citrus juice. Please always use fresh citrus juice. I have sometimes, you know, juiced lemons or limes and then popped it in the freezer and then defrosted it for use. And I haven't really been able to notice a discernible difference. I'm sure some purists will argue with me on that, but just don't buy the squeezy plastic lemon thing. Just don't do it. It's not good. Anyway, let's get started. So I'm gonna start with the spirits. I would say white rum is probably gonna be your most versatile rum. A lot of cocktails where dark rum is used, you could use white rum instead. And then you've got all your things like a daiquiri, a mojito, a pina colada, where white rum is gonna be what you want to be using. So for a daiquiri, it's gonna be rum, citrus and sugar. For a mojito, rum, lime, mint and sugar. And a pina colada is gonna be rum, pineapple and coconut in various forms. So that's a whole bunch of cocktails you can make with just this bottle. There are also a lot of prohibition era cocktails that I'm maybe not gonna mention in a lot of detail when I go through these, but prohibition cocktails were very spirit forward and didn't have a lot of flouncy, you know, mints and garnishes and herb syrups and all the kind of things that modern bartending is much more centered around. So yeah, white rum, definitely need that in there. If you want to also buy a dark rum, a pot still rum, something like that, then that will open certain other doors to you. I would say that in order of rums, I would get white rum and then I would get a dark rum. Then I would get maybe a spiced rum and then at the bottom probably, um, oh goodness me, what's it called? Uh, rum agricole, because the variety of things you can make kind of decreases. You can always add a spiced syrup with non-spiced rum to make an equivalent to a spiced rum, so not particularly important. And rum agricole, from what I have gathered, is quite an acquired taste and is very specific within cocktails. So, rum. Gin, dry gin, dry London gin. You know, you use it in so many things. You use it in, number one, a martini. Number two, uh, a Negroni. Uh, about a hundred different prohibition era cocktails. This is such a staple to the bar that you really can't not have it. The only other type of gin off the top of my head that I can think of would be an Old Tom, which is like a sweet gin, which was used in a lot of prohibition era cocktails, but you can easily use regular gin and maybe add simple syrup or just create a less sweet drink. So I don't think that an Old Tom gin is something that you really need to have in your collection. I personally have never owned a bottle of it. Um, a Martinez would be the first thing that springs to mind that you would use it in, but I really don't think it's essential, but you definitely need a nice dry gin, something that you enjoy drinking in a martini, if martinis are your thing, or a gin and tonic if you maybe prefer a slightly less concentrated drink. And then, you know, you can use that same bottle in all your other cocktails. So make sure that you do like the botanicals that are going on in here. As you can see, I like to buy my gin in very large bottles because I get through a lot of it. Next is whiskey. Now, this would definitely be up for debate whether you're going to buy a bourbon or a rye. Again, it's kind of personal preference. I think a lot of drinks that tend to be made with rye can also be made with bourbon, but maybe not the other way around so much. I don't know if I've ever had a whiskey sour made with rye, but I could be sorely mistaken there. Maybe it's just a personal thing. But with your whiskey, you can make a whiskey sour, you could make a gold rush, you could make a mint julep, you could make a boulevardier, you could make, oh goodness, what else can we make? A Manhattan, that would normally be rye. An old fashioned, 
Again, very personal choice between rye or bourbon. Obviously the other whiskey, uh, the elephant in the room is scotch. Now, as far as cocktails go, I don't think scotch is particularly necessary. It's going to be much more expensive than a, a bourbon or a rye and just it's, it's going to be more limiting. It's very strongly flavoured. It's very um, identifiable in drinks and I'm sure many Scots drinkers would say it's absolute sacrilege to use it in a cocktail. So, you know, personal preference between rye or bourbon. Moving on, we've got tequila here. Um, I've chosen just a Blanco tequila for a long time. I had a Reposado and used that in margaritas with no problem. Again, doesn't really matter. Maybe some people would say that a Reposado is wasted in a margarita, but again, it's personal preference. Um, you could also probably get away with swapping this out for a mezcal. Mezcal is going to be, excuse me, mezcal is going to be um, much smokier. Again, it depends which mezcal you buy. I know that they do vary from being sort of fruitier, more vegetal, earthy, smoky. There are whole spectrums. There's this whole other category called pachuga where they suspend like a raw chicken while they're uh, distilling it so you know there's lots to look into there but for your basic needs I would say a Blanco tequila will be um, your best choice cocktail wise obviously a margarita you know thinking about it I don't know if I really use tequila in anything else no but some people I'm sure do and come on can you really live without margaritas I think you gotta have it. You just gotta have it, because sometimes a margarita is the only thing that will do, and you can't make a margarita without tequila or mezcal. So definitely a bottle of that. Maybe that would mean you'd want a smaller bottle, but ultimately it's not that expensive, and often you end up paying more per ounce for smaller bottles. So yeah, tequila. Now we're gonna move on to, these aren't really what I would classify as spirits so much. So. I have Contrato here. You could um, have Campari in its place. I just used all my Campari and I've moved on to this now to try it instead. A red bitter is pretty much what I'm talking about here. There are a lot of drinks, a lot of Italian kind of, you've got spritzes, you've got, so something like a Campari spritz where you take a bitter and you add Prosecco and soda water. I think the Bicicletta is very similar. Um, you've got obviously the granddaddy of cocktails, the Negroni. Well, it's not the granddaddy, that would probably be the old fashioned, but in, the, in our household anyway, the Negroni is probably the most drunk cocktail. So you've got the Negroni, you've got um, a lot of newer drinks that add like a little hint of Campari. So one I made recently, the Jasmine, um, you've got the Boulevardier, all the riffs on uh, Negroni. Now, as far as that goes, this is obviously classed as an Amaro, there are tons of Amaros out there. If there's something that you prefer, you could switch it for that, but bear in mind that might not work in all cocktails where a red bitter is specified. If you go out and buy a different Amaro that isn't a red bitter, then it might not work in some of those cocktails, but you will be able to create some kind of combination of maybe like gin, your Amaro and vermouth that's gonna give you a delicious Negroni-ish drink. So that's a, a personal choice and I mean, for me, I'm a sucker for Amaro. We have a lot of different Amaros. That's like a whole nother collection other than your essential things. And some people are really not into bitter. And if bitter really, you know, doesn't appeal to you, then definitely I would say leave this out. You could switch it for some other kind of liqueur. Maybe you have a fruit liqueur that you particularly like. Apricot liqueur I see comes up quite a lot in cocktails. Um, that's just up to you. So, yeah, I mean, to make the classic Negroni, you're going to be using this, this, and we'll get onto this, Vermouth. Onto the next one, orange liqueur. It is in so many things. You want to make a margarita, get your orange liqueur. You want to make a sidecar, orange liqueur. You want to make um, uh, between the sheets, orange liqueur. Tons of prohibition era drinks use orange liqueur. It is very versatile. You know, you can add some citrus and some sweetness at the same time. There are lots of different brands out there. Cointreau, Triple Sec comes in a whole different, you know, from 
quite basic, unappealing triple sex to more expensive ones. You've got the Pierre Ferrand Dry Curacao, you've got um, Grand Marnier. That's up to you, find what you like. But definitely I would say that is something you need to have in your bar. Vermouth, now I was thinking hard about this. I know I mentioned a martini here and you would need dry vermouth for that. But then when I was thinking about it, what other drinks do you use dry vermouth in? Maybe some Prohibition era cocktails have dry vermouth in, but ultimately your number one is gonna be the martini. And I don't know, it didn't seem to me like the most essential. If you're someone who let's say, doesn't really like margaritas but loves martinis then maybe you swap out having tequila and instead you buy a bottle of dry vermouth. Vermouth isn't particularly expensive particularly if you buy a more standard brand so you could throw that in and increase the number of bottles here if you want. It's up to you. Sweet vermouth however is in so many things. It's going to be in your Negroni. I seem to be hopping back to the Negroni every two seconds. Um, it's going to be in a lot of spritzes, it's going to be in a lot of Prohibition era cocktails, it's in a Manhattan, it's in tons of things, very useful, also very delicious on ice, maybe with some tonic water or something like that. So I've got Punta Mess here, which is kind of a little bit different, it's sort of bitter and um, a sweet vermouth mixed together, but just a regular sweet vermouth will do. There are so many niche ones coming out now. I know there's one that's made from grapes grown in California. There are um, historic Italian recipes that have been, you know, revived. It all depends how much money you're willing to part with ultimately. And some of those more expensive, fussier ones are gonna be maybe a bit overbearing in certain drinks. So just bear that in mind that it's not always the case that you spend more and somehow get a better product, it might just be more suitable for one application versus another. Last but not least, Angostura bitters, you've got to have it. There are a million different types of bitters available on the market these days. The three big ones I would say would be Angostura and orange bitters and um, Peychaud's bitters. I find myself most often gravitating towards Angostura. It's going to be in your old fashioned, it's going to be in a lot of Prohibition era cocktails, it's going to be in cocktails that it's even not in. You pop it in there and it might bring some more complexity to the drink. I also use orange bitters quite a lot, I like that in my old fashioned as well. Um, that's just me maybe. You can get cherry bitters, you can get chocolate bitters, mole bitters, um, smoky bitters, campfire bitters anything you can imagine someone is making it in a bitters. So that's something to explore, but I will say that they are generally quite pricey, the more niche artisan bitters. This apparently was $7.99. Um, I know there are also some cocktails that use Angostura in larger quantities, um, almost as an ingredient of its own. So if you want to do that, you might consider buying a larger bottle. This has lasted me forever, but I'm using a couple of dashes at a time. So if you're wanting to use ounces of it, then I think it comes in something kind of this big. But yeah, I think Angostura is good value for money if you shop it in the right place. I've seen it in some stores for ridiculous money. So don't be bamboozled. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. I just thought I would let you in on kind of my opinion on what are the essential bottles to get started with. If you have any questions uh, related to this or anything cocktail related, then please uh, don't hesitate to drop them in the comments below and I'll get back to you. And if you want to know, you know, any other Amaros that I like or things like that, then yeah, reach out. And I will see you next week with another cocktail video. If you did like this format, please let me know so I can make more videos like this and hit the subscribe and like buttons below. Thank you.